project that I will present today is an ongoing research project I'm doing while on a year long research, research sabbatical in first in Denmark and then now in the UK. And this overarching project is called News from the Deserts, Informed Citizenship and Public Connectivity in Local Communities Left Behind by Journalism. And one of the topics I'm looking into as part of this project concerns pandemic related news and information. And I must say that I have not finished the data collection for this project yet. So this presentation will focus on presenting the overall project and some preliminary findings related to news and information on the pandemic in one of the communities I investigated uh, in Denmark, where I lived during the fall. So uh, what I will be talking about then is first the background of this overarching project, News from the Deserts, Informed Citizenship and Public Connectivity in Local Communities Left Behind by Journalism. I will say something about the methodological procedure of this project and present the two cases, uh, Fredericksberg in Denmark and Ringwood here in the UK. And then I will present some preliminary findings from uh, Fredericksberg. Uh, only what the local media scene look like, what a content analysis uh, and some descriptive statistics on COVID related news and information in this community in the local media spaces can tell us. And I will end with an example uh, uh, of uh, coverage of wearing face masks uh, in, in a Facebook democracy, so to speak. So first, the background for this project is the decline in local journalism seen in many countries in Europe and in the US, resulting in so-called news deserts, local communities with only minimal journalistic coverage, if any at all. Many uh, have raised concerns about the potential consequences of this development for local democracy, for people's ability to get the information they need in order to establish community connections and become informed citizens of their communities. At the same time, social media and digital information networks have created new avenues for democratic participation and public connectivity also on local levels. So an interesting question is to what degree such new information avenues can serve the same function as journalism used to do for local communities. The purpose of the project is to empirically investigate such new information avenues in local communities left behind by journalism. It specifically targets the means people have available for public connectivity and the degree to which local media and information networks enable informed citizenship. There is a tendency within journalism studies to take the role of journalism for such processes for granted. Therefore, the point of departure for this project is not journalism in itself, but whichever information avenues people have access to and use in order to stay connected and informed. The project is informed by and seeks to advance theories of participatory democracy, informed citizenship and public connectivity. And it utilizes an actor network theory inspired methodological approach where the important actors it be human actors, institutional actors, and technological platform actors, and the practices of and relations between them are not assumed, but empiric empirically identified. The project is guided by the following overarching research question. How are public connectivity and informed citizenship practiced and facilitated in local public spheres left behind by journalism? And as I said, uh, as part of this project, I will investigate a couple of sub themes, one of them being news and information related to the pandemic. So a sub question for that theme is how do COVID related COVID-19 related news and information flow in the same local public spheres. So uh, now I'll move to to uh, say something more about the methodology. In order to answer the research question, the project consists of in-depth case studies of two different local communities, one urban community in Copenhagen, Denmark, and one more regional town community in the UK. These cases are investigated through autoethnography, implying that I, as a researcher, live in both these communities for five, six months, 
each with the aim of becoming an informed citizen of them both, while also doing more systematic analysis of the local public spheres. Um, I'll present the methods uh, more in depth, but first a few words on the two cases. Uh, the first case, the municipality of Ludwigsberg in Copenhagen. This is a somewhat peculiar community since it is almost like an enclave in the middle of Copenhagen. It is surrounded by the much greater council of Copenhagen, but is kept as a separate and independent municipality with its own city council, city hall, and other local authorities. 107,000 people live in Fredericksburg, which is only nine square kilometers big, making it the most densely populated municipality in Northern Europe. Fredericksburg has recently been characterized as a new desert by the Danish trade publication for journalists. And the reason for this characterization was that Fredericksburg until 2018 had two local newspapers covering the municipality. And now there is only one local newspaper left. And as of 2020, this newspaper has only one journalist in addition to the editor, who is also the editor of eight other local newspapers in the Copenhagen region. I moved to Fredericksburg in the beginning of August last year and stayed there collecting data until the end of December. The second case is the case where I'm living now, and it's a much different one, uh, namely the small town of Ringwood, uh, just north of Bournemouth. 17,000 people, or 15,000, I think, live in, in Ringwood, which is a parish, the smallest organizational unit in the British political system. Um, there is no traditional journalistic local newspaper covering the town, and it's therefore what could be a typical example of a British community without a local newspaper, which there are so many of across the country. I moved to Ringwood for February, and I'm staying here collecting data until mid-July. So why have I chosen these two cases? Um, first, because they are somewhat deviant cases. Ringwood, uh, in many respects, represents the typical news desert as they have been identified in the UK, where the decline in local news outlets have been massive in recent decades. Uh, while Fredericksberg, on the other hand, represents a new, uh, different and perhaps more unexpected kind of news desert, namely the urban big city one. The differences between them, also in terms of the differences in media systems between UK and Scandinavia, make it possible to identify a wider range of characteristics of news desert, I believe, and also to investigate what this concept really means, and if it is of value to characterize such communities as news deserts or perhaps as something else. There are also some practical reasons for the choice of these two communities. They are both small enough to make the empirical work feasible, and they are located in countries where I speak the language, and also are close to universities that I have visiting affiliations with. So, um, the most important method I use is also autoethnography, implying that my own experience with living in these communities while trying to become as connected and informed as possible is a key method to collect data. And for this reason, I keep a Microsoft OneNote diary where I write down experiences, impressions, observations, notes on chat with people, and everything I come across relates to news about the community. And here you can see what my Ringwood diary looks like on the mobile app to the left and one of the pages for a specific week on the desktop app to the right. Upon moving to the two communities, I immediately tried to identify what sources of news people tend to use in addition to both mediated and unmediated meeting spaces and ways of staying connected. In Fredericksberg, it very quickly became came clear that Facebook groups are very important, while the weekly local newspaper written by only one journalist was also quite present. It was visible in cafes and was distributed to almost all households, including mine, as a free weekly newspaper. In Ringwood, it was a bit more difficult to assess the dominant news sources. Uh, I got a free newspaper in the mail soon after moving here. This no local newspaper is published by a local politician and is 
community driven in the sense that it seems to uh, to print whatever people send in basically it is in other words not a journalistic project product but it seems important nevertheless and when i ask people in one of the facebook groups uh, where they get their news from here in ringwood this newspaper was mentioned by many as was facebook groups and the community social media app next door since Facebook groups is quite, uh, are quite important in both communities, I start to prepare for more systematic analysis of such groups and also Facebook pages of local entities that had many followers by setting up lists in CrowdTangle. This included pages of local governing bodies, political parties, NGOs, businesses, and also individuals, especially in Fredericksburg, where every city council politicians have their own Facebook page. Uh, through the other source of data, I then identified key information brokers in the local communities, people who seem to have a key role in shaping or facilitating the public spheres. This includes communication workers, especially those handling social media accounts for various actors, local politicians, leaders of local NGOs, administrators of local Facebook groups, and some journalist editors, and also some others. During the period in which I live in the communities, I also identify three to four news stories or topics, which I will analyze in more depth, relates to how information about these stories or topics flows in the local communities, how trustworthy this information is, how disagreements, information, accuracy, and how accountability are negotiated, etc. One of these topics is local news and information regarding COVID-19, which of course is a topic relevant to both communities and which therefore can serve as a benchmark for comparisons, at least potentially. Um, of course, you all know how the pandemic has unfolded. Here you can see the development of infection rates in the Copenhagen region in Denmark and in the Hampshire County in the UK, where Ringwood is located. These two regions are fairly similar in population size. And as you can see, the development during this last year has been almost exactly the same. I moved to Fredericksburg 1st of August, and then everything was fairly normal uh, with very low infection rates and no restrictions. But during the fall, infection rates started to rise and restrictions were enforced. First, wearing face masks in public transportation became mandatory from the 22nd of August, and later also in other public spaces. Uh, ninth, December, a full lockdown was enforced with schools, restaurants, bars, and non essential stores having to close. And in the middle of this lockdown, I moved to the UK uh, with my family, which of course was kind of crazy. Uh, but we managed to get to the UK the day before Brexit, uh, went into self isolation, and moved to Ringwood on the 1st of February, where we are now witnessing the reopening of the society. So uh, let me then present some of the preliminary findings related to the pandemic from Fredericksburg. And I'm sorry that I can't present any findings from Ringwood yet, but as you understand, I'm still collecting data here and uh, I haven't had time to start the analysis yet. Also, the findings I will present and discuss are mainly from news and social media content. I haven't finished analyzing my field notes and the interviews yet. First, I would like to just highlight some of the findings from a city survey that the municipality conducted in 2019. This is a professionally conducted survey with approximately 4,000 respondents, so it's a fairly good source. And one important thing from this survey is that the people in Fredericksburg say they are quite interested in local politics. 11% say they are very interested and 46% say they are somewhat interested. Another important thing is that people were asked where they get their news on local politics from. 65% reply that Fredriksberg Blade, the local newspaper, is the most important source. But we have to remember that this survey was conducted just at the time when the newspaper changed its, its editorial policy and decided to more or less stop covering local politics and also before the number of journalists was downscaled to just one. In the interviews I conducted with key information brokers in Fredericksburg, everyone 
of course, apart from the editor and the journalist of the local newspaper, expressed high degrees of dissatisfaction with how the newspaper had developed. They felt uh, they were now left with Facebook as their main channel uh, for information and news. The local newspaper, uh, Fredriksbergblade, is distributed as a free weekly newspaper to household and is also um, to be found in many cafes. It has struggled financially for several years and has now only one journalist left to cover everything, not only for the printed paper, but also for the online edition and the Facebook page. The editor recently launched a new strategy for the paper where the main purpose now is to create enthusiasm for the local community by covering the everyday life of people and not cover politics. There's also a regional broadcaster located in Fredriksberg, TV2 Lorry. This is a public broadcaster and it's the biggest regional broadcaster in Denmark and covers more than 34 municipalities including the whole greater Copenhagen region. So it does not have enough resources to cover the municipality of Fredericksberg extensively. And then of course, there are national newspapers and broadcasters that occasionally would cover things related to Fredericksberg also. Facebook is a big thing in Fredericksberg and in Denmark in general. There is uh, one big Facebook group in Fredericksberg called We Who Care About Fredericksberg with 13,000 members. This is a private group, meaning that it can't be analyzed with crowd tangle, unfortunately. It is heavily, heavily moderated with extensive guidelines regulating the moderation. Uh, for instance, it doesn't allow posts on politics uh, in general. And this created some tension in the community. And in 2018, someone decided to establish a new public group with a higher degree of free speech. This group has grown quite much. It had about 2.5 thousand members when I moved to Fredericksburg and uh, 3,500 members when I left in December. And I checked just today and now it has more than 5,000 members. In addition to these two groups, uh, there are, of course, some other smaller groups and also uh, local authorities and local politicians are very active on Facebook. The municipality has a quite big staff of communication workers, including a designated Facebook editor. And the members of the city council have their own Facebook pages where they communicate actively. The mayor himself, whom you can see at the top right corner uh, here, uh, he's, he's a very young guy in his early 30s, and he's very active on Facebook. I set up lists in CrowdTangle of the 53 biggest Facebook groups and pages in Fredericksberg, and this chart uh, shows the 20 biggest ones in terms of number of posts published during the fall. The blue ones are groups, and orange ones are pages. Um, the public and quite new Facebook group, We Who Care About Fredericksberg and Live Here, is by far the most active in terms of number of posts. But more than half of the top 20 groups and pages in terms of number of posts are the pages of local politicians and political parties. The mayor, Simon Augustin, is at the very end of this uh, chart. But if we look at interactions, meaning the number of likes, comments, and shares of a post, politicians seem to be very important. The mayor attracts far more interactions when he posts something on his Facebook page than anyone else posting on other pages or in groups. On average, the mayor gets 300 likes, about 75 comments, and 25 shares whenever he posts something. The other two on the top three list here are also prominent members of the city council. So local politicians very much dominate interactions on Facebook. So um, let's now move to some descriptive statistics on COVID related news and information in these media. First, here's a list of topics uh, resulting from a content analysis of all articles published in the printed version of the local newspaper, Fredericksbergblade, during the fall. 
the main focus of the newspaper is to publish community related stuff. And this includes reporting on community events, on civil society in general, and a lot of pictures on the beauty of Fredriksberg. Uh, 28 stories dealt mainly with COVID-19. That's only 4.5% of the articles published in the newspaper. And only six of those 28 articles were actual news articles written by either the journalist or the editor, while the rest of the 28 were short unsigned notes or letters from local politicians. So in other words, the pandemic did not dominate the newspaper content during the, during the fall. If you look at the Facebook groups and pages, they had a higher share of COVID-19 related posts, 10%. Uh, on average. The local newspaper had a higher share of COVID-related posts on its Facebook page than in the printed newspaper, and the municipality's different Facebook pages were the ones with the highest share of COVID-related content, 17% of all posts that uh, local authorities published on Facebook were related to, to COVID-19. So what about the biggest Facebook group then, the one that is not possible to analyze with CrowdTangle since it's a private group, uh, and the one that does not allow political discussions? Um, it quite quickly started to ban COVID-related posts because they created too much heated debate, according to the administrator. Like this example here on the 15th of September, the moderator posted an update stating that discussions, critical, political, on face masks, etc., are deleted because of hateful rhetorics in both posts and comments. This created quite a few comments on the lack of free, free speech, uh, some of which the moderator did allow to pass, uh, like a comment saying free speech is on its way out of Denmark and free speech is a city in North Korea, etc. So this big Facebook group, you, you won't find much COVID related stuff and discussions there. The moderator simply takes them down. The next question is whether there are any differences in how people interact with COVID related posts on Facebook compared to posts on other topics. There are no big differences in the degree to which people interact with COVID posts compared to other posts, but as this charts uh, chart uh, shows people tend to interact less with COVID posts from the local newspaper's Facebook page and more with COVID posts from politicians, the municipality, and with from community organizations. I also looked at if there are any differences in the types of interactions with COVID posts compared to other posts. Uh, there are no big differences here, but there is a significantly higher amount of care emoticons reactions to COVID posts and a significantly less amount of angry emoticon reactions. Uh, but the overall amount of such reactions uh, is not very high, so this is a not very important finding, but still an interesting one, uh, I think. Finally, when it comes to what people choose to share, we see that people share COVID-related posts from local politicians and the municipality to a much higher degree than they share other posts from the same sources. Uh, the, you can see this in the charts here regarding politicians. The orange uh, bar is uh, shares of COVID posts and the blue bars are shares of post on other topics, all other posts, basically. Also, COVID posts from, from the local newspaper is shared far less than other posts the newspaper publishes. So to summarize this data, we can conclude that the local newspaper and the biggest Facebook group had very limited coverage of COVID-19 and that local politicians and local authorities were the most influential actors. This could mean that people trusted the information local politicians and local authorities provided in, uh, in the sense that they found it shareworthy 
and that the local authorities and local politicians had a very successful communicative approach to COVID content on Facebook. This is also supported by the fact that COVID-19 uh, uh, content in general attracted far less angry reactions and more care reactions than other types of content. So let me now end this presentation with an example related to how the use of face masks was dealt with in this Facebook democracy of the uh, Bank. First of all, the admins of the Facebook groups are important gatekeepers of news and information in Fredrik's Bank. As mentioned, the admin of the biggest Facebook group banned discussions on face masks. Um, and local authorities and local politicians were therefore left with using the other Facebook group, in addition, of course, to their own pages, to urge people to wear face masks and explain why it was important. But the admin of the public Facebook group, the second biggest one, was very anti-masks and used every opportunity he had to argue against wearing face masks. And you can see one example here where the vice mayor of the city has posted a video on the Facebook group explaining why it is important that people use masks. And the admin of the Facebook group immediately starts an argument with the vice mayor in the comments where he argues that forcing people to wear face masks is a violation of everyone's personal freedom and that it, it, that it is also a crime. And this created lots of debates, not only in this post, but in many others, and a lot of uncertainty about research actually says about the usefulness of face masks and the legal status of forcing people to wear them. And this confusion also created lots of room for, for misinformation to, to thrive about whether or not face masks are, are useful and what research says, etc. Uh, but Facebook activity related to face masks also created space for quite efficient public participation. Here is an example where someone writes a post on the municipality's Facebook page claiming that face masks create a litter problem, especially near metro station. Uh, the municipality's Facebook editor first replies that this shouldn't be a problem and that there are enough litter bins in place to handle all the used face masks. But then people argued against this in the same thread, and this high amount of comments actually made the municipality turn around and say that, okay, we will place out more litter bins near a metro station. And the next day when I went out to take the metro, I could see that more litter bins had indeed come into place. So this was an example of a very efficient participatory democracy, so to, to speak. And related to this story uh, is how insignificant journalism becomes. Because the litter problem was identified and also reported on Facebook, and it was solved on Facebook. The local newspaper reported on it the next day on its Facebook page, uh, when it was already resolved. They have even used a citizen photo. So this is an example of a story that could have been a typical local journalism story, namely identifying a local problem that citizens care about, reporting on that problem, and then making authorities do something about it. Now it was all dealt with without any involvement of journalism at all. So I think this is a nice example of both the sort of participatory potential of Facebook and also the potentially insignificance of, of local journalism. So some conclusions and reflections before I end this talk. There is, of course, much more analysis to be done here and also even data collection, which I haven't finished yet here in, in Ringwood. But uh, the lack of local journalism seemed to create both opportunities for unexpected actors to take charge of public discourse, like, for instance, the Facebook group administrators. And local politicians have a sort of a choice to become publishers if they think they could benefit from it. And in Fredrik's they definitely do so. They 
have become publishers of their own very professionally set up Facebook pages, which they use actively. Uh, and local authorities, the municipality in itself becomes editors. They hire, hire editors to sort of deal with the information and communication on their social media accounts. And these local Facebook groups uh, admins are the new uh, gatekeepers with very personalized and uh, sort of ad hoc guidelines and whatever agendas they might have. And the overall lack of professional editing of content uh, created by this situation creates um, a lack of overview, the kind of overview that a newspaper would provide, and also ample space for, for misinformation to, to be distributed. And uh, my impression so far is that this leaves the local democracy and local public spheres in a quite fragile state where it's very dependent on actors who have uh, alternative motives for why they are operating in the public spheres than the motives, motives of journalism. I will end there and I'm happy to take any questions or, or discuss any matters that uh, any of you would, would like to discuss regarding this group. But as, I, as I said, there is still much to do here and this is very, very unfinished. But thank you for listening.